John chapter 7, picking up where we left off last week. Allow me to read from verse 25. Hear the word of the Lord. Some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, Is not this the man who, whom they seek to kill? And here he is, speaking openly, and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from. And when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. Verse 28. So Jesus proclaimed, as he taught in the temple, You know me, and you know where I come from, but I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true, and him you do not know. I know him, for I come from him, and he sent me. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? And then jump down to verse 37. There's an invitation here that Jesus gives to each and every one of us. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. We have seen in our study of the Gospel of John that the aim of this Gospel is to show us what Jesus does and what he says so that we can believe in him and have life in his name. Actually, in the prologue, this is exactly what the Apostle John writes. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So everything that John records has this goal in mind, and that is the purpose of this book, that the reader would believe. And he uses multiple stories and angles, interactions with people, and even through the death and resurrection account, John's aim is to convince you to believe. And so John has already shown us a number of barriers and, and things that, are, that we are to turn from, that we are to repent from, in order for our belief in Jesus Christ to be real. Actually, the Gospel of John is a gospel track. It's a concise summary of the good news of God. So we should read it, we should receive it, we should study it, and we should share it, and then repeat the process. So we find ourselves in the seventh chapter of John's Gospel, where he has continued to show us in this section the pattern of unbelief towards Jesus Christ. And in our last lesson, we saw that true belief seeks the will of God and is not concerned about the approval or appearances to others. And so where we find ourselves is that Jesus is starting to receive some conflict. It's becoming more and more dangerous for Jesus to be out in public. So we find ourselves at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. 
He didn't go up to Jerusalem with his brothers, but he stayed back where he could not be seen. And then when the time was right, he began to teach in the temple. And while preaching and teaching there, Jesus once again comes into conflict with the local religious leaders. And in verse 19 of of John 7, Jesus proves that his will is to do the will of his Father because he seeks God's glory and does what God the Father says. So Jesus declares that he knows that the Jewish leaders are trying to kill him. And this desire all the more confirms not only their unbelief, but also that they're seeking their own glory rather than the glory of the Father. So once again, he drew flack from the religious establishment for his healing of people on the Sabbath. So Jesus in turn rebukes them for making incorrect, incor- incorrect, excuse me, judgments about himself where we left off last week. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So that's where we left off last week. And the controversy, it continues with the residents of Jerusalem. They're now entering into the conversations. The crowd takes note of his profound words. Uh, his history of miracles and the inability of the religious leaders to silence him. So this causes the people to openly question their spiritual leaders and this embarrassment is a milestone in an effort to permanently silence Jesus. We got to get rid of this guy. He is bad for business and he is bad for my reputation. So what we have and where we pick up is that we have the reactions to the claims of Christ. That is verses 25 through 36. Look again at verse 25. Some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, Is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is speaking openly. And they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? Isn't it interesting that if you were with us last week, it's it's interesting that the Jewish leaders were denying that they were trying to kill Jesus in verse 20. Yet the people themselves know what the truth is is. They know they're trying to kill Jesus. And in verse 26, the people are wondering now if perhaps the leaders thought that Jesus was actually the Messiah, that he was the promised one of Israel because they had said nothing to him. They could not stop him. So some of the people are confused as to why the Jewish authorities are not taking any action against Jesus as he teaches in the temple. So then in verse 27, it seems as though the blinders go back on. Look at verse 27. The people say, but we know where this man comes from. And when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from from. That thought is quickly extinguished because they know that Jesus is from Galilee and they believe that no one would know where the Christ would come from, referring to the Old Testament scriptures. And this is another example of the people and the religious leaders judging on the appearances and false standards. We know Jesus' background. We know where he grew up. We know his parents, but we can't know who the Messiah is. 
Well, where did they get this thinking from that they could not know the one that God had promised way back in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3? Well, there was a common misconception that the people of that day had. Some teachers of that day had expressed that no one could really know where the disciple or where the Messiah, excuse me, where the Messiah would come from. Many people heard and believed this teaching, even though it has no biblical basis. Uh, and as with other claims made by those who reject Jesus, this suggestion that they're saying, it actually contradicts God's word. Old Testament prophets did indeed predict where the Messiah would come from. And the scriptures had spoken very clearly as to the birthplace of the Messiah. In fact, other people at this same festival will later make that point when we get to verse 42, though they seem not to realize that Jesus does fulfill this requirement that this prophecy that was well back in Israel's history had indeed been fulfilled by Jesus the Christ. Remember when the Magi had come to Herod to find out where the king of the Jews had been born? Back in Matthew's gospel, listen to what Matthew says here in Matthew chapter 2 verses 1 through 6. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So some 30 years earlier from John chapter 7, listen to what the chief priests and the scribes said. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. See, they're quoting from Micah 5.2. The chief priests and the scribes knew the prophecies of Micah, for it is written... So how come the religious leaders and Jewish people of Jesus' day didn't know? It's because many Jews in Jesus' day had been deceived into believing a lie. Why would this false teaching arise? Because if you keep the people ignorant you can control them. Isn't that how the cults are able to draw people in through ignorance, through works, through everything else except Jesus? It makes me think of the Catholic monk and priest Martin Luther who discovered in his time, back in the 16th century, he discovered the false teachings and corruption that had crept into the Roman Catholic Church. And he simply wanted the leaders and the Pope to know. He wanted to help. But the Pope and its leaders at that time didn't want to know the truth. The German people and, and the European people did not have the Bible in their own language. It was all in Latin. And the common people didn't know or did not have a copy of God's word. They had to depend on the leaders of the church at that time. And what happened is that led to ignorance. That is the root of deception of people today as well not knowing the word of God. And this is not a new tactic 
by the enemy, by Satan. The serpent in the Garden of Eden deceived Eve by twisting and denying the word of God. The people of the prophet Jeremiah's day, as, as, as they are going into captivity, were being deceived by false teaching. Listen to what Jeremiah proclaims in Jeremiah 29. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you and do not listen to the dreams that they dream for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name i did not send them declares the lord and then luke in the book of acts calls the christians uh in berea the the jewish christians that they were more noble-minded because they refuse to be deceived by false teaching. Acts 17, 11. Now these Jews were no, more noble than those in Thessalonica because they received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, daily to see if these things were so. So when Paul came there, to Berea, and Paul taught, they checked out what he said to see if it lined up with God's word, the scriptures. Boy, when, when, when I think about this and how deception can come, it, it made me think of a friend uh, that I had uh, years back, some some 20 years ago, and and as a as a fairly new believer, and then and then as I started to God started to call me into the full time ministry as a pastor. This friend had gone to a church in the town where I was pastoring, and he started to talk about the different teachings, the blessings. And cursings, and and that are uh, certainly in the Old Testament, but but Jesus was made a curse for us, and that's for uh, another time to share more into that story. But he talked about blessings and cursings. But the thing that really disturbed me was he talked about that he was baptized six times, six times by the same pastor, and I asked him why, and and he said because my pastor said so. But then I said, your pastor said so, but where does it say that in the word of God? And he said, I, I don't know. You ask my pastor. And, and he started to get angry. And, and, and I just stopped the conversation at that point. What I learned from that time is that you and I cannot fall into the same trap that many people fall into. You can know for sure what is from God and what is not. We can search the scriptures. We can be good Bereans. Is it good to ask your pastor for counsel? Yes, but that counsel must and has to come from the word of God. Well, at, that, at this point, our Lord raises his voice in the temple so everyone could hear. Look at verse 28. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, You know me and you know where I come from, but I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true and him you do not know. I know him for I come from him and he sent me. Jesus may have been speaking actually with an ironic tone in his voice as he says these things. In essence, he says, yes, you think you know me and where I come from, but you really don't. You really don't know me. And then he explained why they didn't know him, because they don't know the Father. Now this was a serious accusation to make against an Orthodox Jew. 
They prided themselves on knowing the true God. That explains their reaction in verse 30 that we'll see in just a moment. But Jesus went even further. He boldly asserted that he not only knew the Father, but he was sent by him. He was not simply born into this world like any other human. He was sent to earth by God. This means that he existed before he was born in Bethlehem. We see their reaction to his claims of being the Christ. Verse 30, So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. We'll see this phrase throughout our study of the Gospel of John. We will read of Jesus' hour. His mission was directed according to his heavenly Father's divine timetable. And when we read this phrase, his hour, we understand that he is talking about the culmination, the climax of his earthly ministry. The time when he would be betrayed, arrested, tortured, crucified, and ultimately glorified. In fact, in John 12, we'll read Jesus saying, And Jesus answered them, My hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And indeed, the resurrection of Jesus Christ bears much fruit. There will be a time when it would be right for Jesus to be apprehended, but that is not in the plan for right now. And for you and I, you know, as we, as we make our way through these verses and understand much more of who Jesus is, there's some application for you and I. There is safety and comfort in God's will and in his sovereignty that he is in totally control, in control of every situation and circumstance. In fact, you should write these verses down. Number one, God has a plan for our lives. Isaiah 46 says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish my purpose. And then Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, For we, believers, are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So God has a plan for our lives, and his plan, secondly, is good, and it is based on love. And, and as, as God speaks to the prophet Jeremiah, as Israel is going into captivity because of their sin of idolatry and turning from God, God isn't finished with his people. In Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for peace and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. So that's why, Christian, we can with confidence say like the prophet Isaiah in chapter 12, verse 2, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. So you and I, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, need to remember this and remind others just how great God is and remember how much He loves you. So as we go back to our text, 
There are two basic responses to Jesus at this time in verse 31 and 32. Yet, John writes, many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? And the Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. So some were trying to get rid of him. Some came to believe in him. And the Pharisees, the religious leaders, don't like Jesus. In fact, they want to kill him because he's honest with them. He's not afraid to point out their hypocrisy and their self-righteousness. His unwillingness to coddle them has enraged them to the point where they're actively seeking to murder him. However, everyone in Jerusalem is talking about Jesus. That's a good thing. Everything he said and did pointed to him being the one sent by God to defeat sin and rescue people from death. And in the process, many have come to faith in him. So before Jesus invites the crowd to receive him, he warns them that they must make a decision. Verse 33, Jesus then said, I will be with you a little longer, and then I am going to him who sent me. We know who that him is, God in heaven. Then Jesus, or verse 34, you will seek me and you will not find me where I am, you cannot come. So let me just summarize what Jesus is saying here. He's basically saying this, I am not here much longer. I'm headed back to heaven in a few months and you're not going to be able to find me there because you won't be there. So he will be leaving soon to return to his father. And things are going to change. They can't wait indefinitely to decide to come to, to him. Now, of course, they have no idea of what he was talking about. Listen to their response in verse 35. The Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go? that we will not find him. Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, you, you will seek me and you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? You see what's going on? They're, 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 they're pondering what Jesus is saying. Now, the, that word dispersion in your Bible, the dispersion was the name given to the Jews that lived outside the land of Israel. These were the ones who were dispersed through the Babylonian captivity. And what always amazes me about this, now as a believer in Christ, you know, having the Holy Spirit who, who makes sense of his word, they ponder his words, but they don't receive his words. They don't ask him for clarification. They're just kind of muttering amongst themselves. Why do you think that is? I think it's simply pride. It's self-righteousness. They desire to approach God in their own way. So I would ask you today, do you understand what Jesus has been saying to you in his word? If not, don't give up. Ask for his guidance. Ask him for clarification. Ask him for help. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So now we come to the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, and Jesus extends an amazing invitation to the people. And that's what we have in verses 37 and 39 through 39, the Savior's invitation. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up 
and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, John's helping us, now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. He wasn't resurrected from the dead yet. I think, you know, as I read this invitation, this rivers of living water, the invitation comes also with a promise. And I think about during the course of year that uh, of the year, each one of us receives invitations, and some of them are gladly received. And we may get an invitation to a wedding of good friends or family, to an intimate dinner, maybe to a concert, to an evening of quiet conversation. And then there's other invitations that are not so welcome, and we find ourselves asking, do I have to go there? How can I get out of responding to that one? Or, I don't need another credit card, right? We get invitations like, like these all the time. We come now, though, to the most important and happy invitation you and I can ever receive. And there is an, also a great promise that goes along with it. Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Do you hear it? An invitation and a promise. One of the most dramatic acts of the ministry of Jesus Christ is described in this portion of John's gospel. Now consider the context when Jesus is declaring this in the temple. On the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, you know what the priest would do? The priest would read from Zechariah 14.8, In that day it shall be that living water shall flow from Jerusalem. And so Jesus is standing there and, and saying, I, I am these living waters. I am the one who, who will produce this living water. And in this feast, for seven days as the people had been living in these little booths and, 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 and tabernacles to commemorate how God has provided for their ancestors in the wilderness for 40 years in the time of Moses and the Exodus. And then they would commemorate this, the miraculous provision of water by God from the rock that Moses struck during their wilderness wanderings. So the priests, in celebrating this feast, would draw water from the pool of Siloam and pour it out on the temple floor during each day of the feast. And then on the last day of the feast, the priests would return from the pool of Siloam with their vessels empty, signifying that when the Israelites entered the promised land, water from the rock was no longer needed. So Jesus chooses this time, the right time, this time of the feast to speak up and say, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. Wow. Can you imagine what an effect this had upon the people? They knew what he was claiming. The promised Messiah has come. And so as Jesus saw the people rejoicing during this feast, he knew they were still in need of spiritual water. He knew they needed him. That spiritual water from the Holy Spirit who was soon to come. So Jesus invited the whole congregation of Israel to come and drink of living water, just as he had previously extended a similar invitation to the woman at the well, back in John chapter 2. To come to Jesus and drink is to believe in him as the Savior 
and the source of eternal life. The bubbling inner spring and the thundering flow of living water are references to the Holy Spirit and his indwelling of all who believe. Have you ever thought about this? Some of the things that God has done in, 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 in his design of us as, as human beings, that, that we are limited physically and mentally and, and uh, physiologically in, in our bodies, that we have this thirst drive, we have this hunger drive. That's because being thirsty is a gift. We don't always see hard things in our lives as a grace of God in our lives. Does anyone here have an example of how God's grace was demonstrated in an unlikely way? That's why the psalmist would cry in, in Psalm 42 as the deer pants for flowing streams. So pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and be appear before God. Being thirsty is a gift. How are you going to satisfy your thirst? And as believers, we must remain thirsty for God, especially in a society that we have most of our tangible needs met. When you believe in Jesus Christ, you do not depend upon a pitcher of water being brought to you, but you have a river of living water flowing from you. This is a real reason to rejoice. That living water is the Holy Spirit who will not only satisfy you, but will also become a source of life and blessing within you that flows from you and will bless others. Now, you may be sitting there wherever you may be at, and you may say to yourself, but Pastor Bob, I am a born-again Christian, and I don't feel like the Holy Spirit is flowing from me and blessing others. This can happen to us as believers. We can become spiritually dry because we have quenched the Holy Spirit of God. And so what happens is we can get clogged up. And so we need some spiritual Drano, don't we? It reminds me of the example, if you ever get the opportunity to go to Israel, that you have this living water, these three springs that flow into the Jordan River. And then from the Jordan River, it flows down south to the Sea of Galilee. And as you follow the Jordan River and into the Galilee, there's so much life around and then ultimately this water flows all the way down to the Dead Sea where there's no outlet and there's no life. We sometimes need to have our drains cleared so that the living water, the Holy Spirit can flow through us. Well, where can I get some of this spiritual Drano that you're talking about, Pastor Bob? Well, Jesus gives us and reminds us how we can do this. In Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, asks you and I to look past our selfishness, die to ourselves, and follow him. He will do the rest, and this is how we allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through us. So, back to our text. This promise that Jesus is making to the people and the religious leaders is that some of them are going, are they're just going through the motions. They're just playing church. They're following the ru religious rules and regulations and feast days. They, they put their trust in the religious exercises and, and in the temple. And really, they actually don't even know God. This is how they have put God 
in a box. It reminds me of this story that I read this week. There was this little girl named Mary, and she had a kitten named Gabriel, little Gabriel, a fluffy little kitten. Mary loved Gabriel and carried him around wherever she went. Well, one day Mary's mother saw Mary walking around without Gabriel. So mom asked, where's Gabriel? Oh, I'll get him, Mary said, as she ran to the other end of the house. And then she immediately returned carrying Gabriel in her arms. And this is what Mary said, or her mother said to Mary, how did you know where he was? It was easy, replied Mary. I've been keeping him in my dresser drawer so I can find him when I want him. Sometimes that's the way we treat the Lord. Like a genie, if you will. We just rub the lamp. Come on, God, deliver. Or we want to keep him in our dresser drawer. We put him in a box. So when we want him or need him, we'll know right where to find him. The Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said that sometimes we can be guilty of taking God's word and treat his word like a medicine cabinet where we just pull whatever remedy we need and just apply that to whatever situation we may be going through and totally miss the whole picture. God wants us to let him out of the drawer so he can work in our lives and in the lives of others. Well, the people of John 7 were saying, this temple, these rules are the way to God. Instead of looking to the Lord, they were looking to the temple and the law for their salvation. But God is not about a building or a bunch of rules. It's about a relationship with him. Our sin separates us from God so that that is why he sent his son to take our place and pay the price for our sin and be a sacrifice. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ restores our relationship with God. So Jesus is telling the people that he is the one promised in Zechariah 14 and in Isaiah and in other places. He is the one who can provide the living water they need. And he still has that same offer for us today. Well, as you can imagine, this stir that Jesus created by his invitation caused the people to ponder. And this is what will always happen when you choose between religion and relationship with, uh, with Jesus. You know what happens? Division. So our last point today is the crowd's mixed reaction. And we see that in verses 40 through 52. Verse 40. So when they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. You probably notice that Jesus has a real knack for dividing people. Some people thought he was a prophet, promised back in Deuteronomy 18. Could this be him? Some thought he was the Messiah, while others said he couldn't possibly be the Messiah. They argued over where the Messiah would come from. He can't be. This guy comes from Galilee, and, and the Christ is supposed to come from Bethlehem. It says so in the book of the prophet Micah. And isn't it interesting, even in the Gospels, in, in Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel, there's genealogies there that show us that Jesus indeed came from the line of David, that he would be an offspring of David. So they have this, these right scriptures, but wrong information, 
right? Uh, they, uh, the, the prophet Micah did indeed say that Messiah would come to Bethlehem. And we all know the story of Jesus' birth, right? Every Christian uh, Christmas, even if you're not a believer, you know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. We know that he was on the way to register for the census, Joseph and Mary. And then they fled to Egypt, and later they returned to Nazareth, which is in Galilee. So, as often occurred with Jesus, the audience is split into two groups based on their reaction to the truth. Some believe while others sought his destruction. Some people wanted to grab him, but no one did. No one dared touch him in public while opinions remained divided. People will always be divided over Jesus Christ. Divided into one of two groups. You either believe or you don't believe. You reject the truth. So don't be shocked when you sense divisions due to your stand as a believer in Jesus Christ. It's inevitable. It happened here, and it will happen in our lives as well. Well, the religious leaders are starting to lose their grip upon the people. Verse 45, the officers then came to the chief priests. These, these officers that were, that were sent out from the Pharisees back in, in verse 32. The officers then came to the chief priests and the Pharisees who said to them, Why did you not bring him? And the officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. Wow. So these Sanhedrin police who had been sent by the Sanhedrin to have Jesus arrested, when these officers return without Jesus in their, their custody, the religious leaders that want to know why this happened. But when these officers hear Jesus face to face, it blows their mind. No one spoke like this man. This is a lesson for you wherever you're at in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Listen to Jesus for yourself. There's a difference between what some people say about Jesus and who Jesus really is. Now, some of you have grown up hearing about Jesus, but you have never really checked him out for yourself. So instead of only listening to what people say about Jesus, be sure you go to the Bible and check it out for yourself. And you know what you may find? You may find yourself responding like Peter, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Well, the Pharisees, they were beside themselves. Verse 47, the Pharisees answered these officers, have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is a curse. This crowd of people who do not know the law, they're, they're anathema. They're, they're accursed. Notice the pride of the Pharisees is really plain. And they also despised the common people, the people they were uh, uh, charged to minister to, to help, to teach. They hoped to shame and intimidate these officers who didn't arrest Jesus with the idea that all the smart and spiritual people don't follow Jesus, and neither should you. Then one of their own steps forward, and a familiar voice speaks up. Verse 50, Nicodemus, and then John adds, who had gone to him before and who was one of them, said to them, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? This is such wise counsel by Nicodemus. We know Nicodemus is a seeker. We, we've seen that in John 3. And, and so he's saying our, our very law that is from God show, tells us to not judge someone until we check him out. 
That's what Nicodemus says to these leaders. We should not judge Jesus without letting him speak for himself. Listen to Jesus before you dismiss Jesus. That's good counsel. If you are a skeptic, if you are a critic of the Bible, listen to Jesus before you dismiss Jesus. Now, Nicodemus knew they were breaking the law and seeking to arrest Jesus. And Nicodemus tries to reason with these religious leaders, warning them against judging Jesus hastily. Well, these religious leaders are factually ignorant. Willingly ignorant and factually ignorant. Look at verse 52. They replied, Are you from Galilee too? That's an insult. Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. So thinking Nicodemus a fool, his fellow Pharisees asked him if he too was an unschooled Galilean. To be called a Galilean was like being called stupid. That, that's what they're saying. And in the Pharisees' minds, only dumb Galileans believe this idiot from Galilee. And I am amazed that these guys who prided themselves on their knowledge of Scripture didn't know that according to 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25, there was indeed a prophet from Galilee. His name? Jonah. <laughs> one, of the, one of the famous, most famous Old Testament prophets, right? Jonah was from Galilee. I like how Henry Alford helps us when he says, It was not historically true. For two prof prophets at least had arisen from Galilee, Jonah and the greatest of the prophets, Elijah, and perhaps also Nahum and, and Hosea. Their contempt for Galilee and for Jesus made them lose sight of historical accuracy. A lot of people, if you'll notice, when they try to defend why they reject that Jesus is indeed God, a lot of people don't have their facts straight about Jesus and reject Christ on faulty information. And so in verse 53, without reaching a final decision about Jesus, they all went home. What a sad picture. The invitation from Jesus to come and receive the living water is rejected by those who should have known better. Then there are those who do come to believe in Jesus. So where do you fit in today? Jesus always makes it a personal issue. Everyone has to decide for themselves who Jesus is and what they are going to do with him. There was division back then, and there's always is concerning Jesus. You can't be neutral about Jesus Christ. Jesus will say in the next chapter, therefore I said to you that you will die eternally for your, in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am him, you will die in your sins. That eternal death is not annihilation. That means that there is a hell that is prepared for the devil and his angels and for those who reject Jesus' invitation. There is a cost to our sin, yet God gives a cure and has made a payment. Jesus has extended this amazing invitation to all who come and receive him. Do you see the pattern that Jesus gives? And in fact, when you look at verses 37 and 38 again, Jesus says, thirst, come, drink, overflow. Thirst, come, drink, and overflow. This is always the spiritual sequence. We hunger and thirst for God's blessings. We come to Christ and we're satisfied. Then the Holy Spirit can flow from us and it is from this overflow that it will result in an outreach to others. Jesus just asks us 
to come. He gave everything so that you and I can have everything. He gave his life on the cross that we would have forgiveness and that the Holy Spirit would dwell within us. Let's pray.